really? Nope. Did you say you were? I never said that. Oh. <laughs> oh, I thought I had one. Nope. Oh, sure to thank you. Sure. Dear Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine today that just livened my spirits and my soul and gave me some energy, and I just thank you for that. Um, I thank you for the freedom that we have to be able to get together with our church family and eat a meal and celebrate and come together and dive into your word. And we just ask that you will speak to each one of us where we are in your word and you will enlighten us and we will learn from, from those things that you want us to learn tonight. And I just ask that we all go in safety and in peace in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, we will be on page 119 starting, but um, maybe we can quickly recap. We're on uh, episode eight. Uh, if you remember episode eight, anybody remember how this opens? <laughs> They're trying to navigate their way to wherever they're going, and they're trying to figure out the best route to get mm -hmm. around Samaria. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Before that, though, when the whole episode opens. Oh, it's uh, Jacob digging the well. Yeah. Jacob digging the well. Remember, and he's interacting with a person from that land, and they're talking about well, what God do you serve, mm -hmm. and where is he? Like, where's his... Where's his statue? Don't bring anything. What do you mean? How do you bring your God with you if he's not in a chariot or in something? And kind of an interesting interaction that you see there and what it must have been like at that time. And um, very powerful moment though when Jacob says, Well, we didn't we didn't choose him. Mm -hmm. He chose us. Um, and so flash forward, right? They're digging that well, and then the well appears later. That's where. Um, we we meet um, the woman at the well and everything. So very cool episode. But you're right that the, the um, we get to see where um, the disciples are leaving Capernaum, and they depict Nicodemus standing around the corner, having this very earthly or some sort of a spiritual draw to want to go, and yet there's this thing holding him back where his wife had told him, I really like our life, and he says, I really like our life too. And I think he portrays such a wonderful kind of internal struggle, and I think humans can relate to that internal struggle at times, where, man, but there's this thing in the world, and, but Jesus is calling me, and so we're going to see that. The disciples leave, and yes, they're on their way, and uh, Jesus <laughs> come like, through these trees and they all start turning left and Jesus just turns right and says, where are you going? Yeah. Man? Oh, yeah. We're going this way. Why? We don't want to go that way. The, the map says. But the map says over here is quicker. Nope, we've got a purpose to go this way. And um, I think they do a good job too showing the hatred between the Jews um, and the Samaritans at that time. And everybody's pointing fingers and blaming kind of who who started the hate and, and I'm not sure the hatred shows up until season two, really. Oh, for right. sure. Yeah, we, we see a lot of the we see the hesitancy mm -hmm. of of the disciples, but I think that the true disdain doesn't show up until yeah. no, that's the next that's valid. Um and Spoiler then alert. this wonderful uh <laughs> this wonderful interaction with the Samaritan woman at the well and, and then the uh the episode ends. So I'm wondering what in that episode, if you recall that, was kind of a stick out to you, any um, phrases, any scenes, anything that you'd like to share before we dive in? I just started watching it again this afternoon, but I didn't get to get very far into it, so it's too hazy in my That's okay. <clears throat> we also get to, get to see uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in this episode. For me, what I love in that is, um, you know, they depict Jesus coming. It's so funny because Simon and Andrew have these nets. And Simon is so concerned about leaving for a while. And he's leaving his, his bride, his wife, and his mother-in-law who's sick. And 
he wants to follow Jesus and he knows he needs to, but he's concerned about what's going on home. And so he's going to take the fishing nets and I'm going to go sell. Well, Jesus comes in and he's like, come here. Oh no, we're going to sell these nets. And immediately like Andrew looks at him and just puts the nets down and follows <laughs> immediately. And Simon's kind of like, eh, I got to sell these things. And Jesus said, put the nets down. Come on, come in here, go visit your mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. But then there's a great um, interaction between Jesus and Simon's wife, Eden. And I love the line when he says, I see you. Mm -hmm. I see you. And there's a very powerful moment that I don't think we today always understand. <laughs> the word says when we are married and we enter into a healthy sexual relation with our spouse we become one flesh mm -hmm. and he says you are one flesh with simon which means when i ask him to do something it affects you mm -hmm. and you are also in a way going with me um and so that was the whole thing that they depicted simon saying or jesus saying i see you mm -hmm. and because of that i'm going to fix things here at home I love his little interaction where he says something like, Simon's hard enough to be aware. Mm -hmm. You think I want to worry Simon? Yeah, we don't, I don't want to worry Simon yeah. in our party yeah. going, right? No, no idea. <laughs> Which is kind of a little But thing. I think the point that you make is a powerful one in that they juxtapose their marriage with the marriage that the woman at the well is trying to annul. Mm -hmm. When he says, you are my property, and I do not part easily with my, with my possessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think Jesus saying, I see you to a woman, no less, when so often they were considered mere property. Mm -hmm. They were bought. And oh, it's true. I mean, he flipped society on its right. head with the way he treated women. So I, I think those two marriages. Hmm. Are are there for a reason? Mm -hmm. It's true. Anything else from the episode people wanted to call out? Yes, Kenton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nicodemus ultimately, after being called on the rooftop, chooses not to go. If he had chosen to go, God would have made a way. But because he chose not to go, he was able to continue to talk with his friend, Joseph of Arimathea. And when Jesus died, the two of them took the body down off the cross and placed it in a tomb. If they had not taken it off the cross, as reputable people within the Jerusalem society that Pilate knew and respected and allowed to take the body, the likelihood that Jesus would have been placed in an unmarked mass grave is huge. And then on Easter morning, the women would have had nowhere to go, no way to find him, and there would have been no tomb to open. Because Nicodemus didn't go, we have an empty tomb and we have a resurrection. And prophecy was fully fulfilled because of that. Yeah, yeah, it's a mind bender, right? It's a real mind bender. I read that this morning. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Let's dive in here, page 118 and 19. 118 uh, has this great scripture from Isaiah 43. It says, Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They, lay, they lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Powerful. Um, and so this one uh, is titled, You Are Carried. Looks like we've got um, some dialogue. Or, not really dialogue because there's more than two people. We have some conversation happening. We have Andrew. Who would like to read for Andrew? Say, got it. All right. Andrew's your favorite character. <laughs> All right, Rayleigh will be Andrew. Who would like uh, to be Matthew? Take Matthew. Big James. I'll be Big James. Jesus. <laughs> we do have a 
uh, uh, John. Mm -hmm. John, you want to be John? Do you have your book? I left in the car. We just haven't had an extra one. <laughs> John, you'll be John. There's one uh, one thing for John on the second dialogue. And I guess I can read for Jesus since everybody seems to be running from that. <laughs> All right. Really? Start us up. What city is that? Uh, Jezreel, the uh, southernmost town in Galilee. Uh, from there, we veer east to the Jordan River. Rabbi, where are you going? Do you need something? This way, friends. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, the map shows Jezreel is two miles southeast of here. It is met by a road east to the Jordan. We need to adjust our course 30 degrees. We're to... not going to the Jordan. We're going through Samaria. Are you telling a joke? There's a place that I want to stop. Plus, it makes our journey shorter by almost half. And, and our odds of violent attack are uh, more likely by double. Is that an exact figure? Forgive me, teacher, but it's safer to go around Samaria by the way of Jordan and the Decapolis. Did you join me for safety reasons? <laughs> but Rabbi, they're Samaritans. Good observation, Big James. What's your point? Rabbi, even if people, people hmm. feed our temple with the dead bones, they hate us. They fought against us with the Seleucids. In the Maccabean Wars, I've never, ever spoken to a Samaritan. And we destroyed their temple 100 years ago, and none of you here were present for any of these things. Listen, if we're going to have a question and answer session, every time we do something you're not used to, it's going to be a very annoying time together for all of us. <laughs> Love that interaction that they depict, because um, you see Jesus's frustration a little bit and yet it's in a loving and patient way. Loving, patient way. I mean the guy who is the actor for that, Jonathan, whatever his last name is, Rumi. 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 Um I think just does such a good job of, of portraying that right on the line of I'm bold, I'm speaking. You're gonna listen and follow. And I'm going to do it loving mm -hmm. and still kind, but make you think and make you go, oh, yeah. This is one of those times where I think uh, the script writers um, did a pretty amazing job. Almost, um, not to be sacrilegious, but almost a scriptural job. Mm -hmm. Where Jesus saying, and none of you yeah. were here for any of it. Mm -hmm. I was. <laughs> right. None of none of you. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, of course. Samaria is uh, that was the capital of the Israel troops, where Jerusalem was the capital of Judah, right? When the tribes split. But Samaria, they didn't like them because they intermarried with the other people. Is that true? That is true. Okay. And they worshipped in the, the high places, which used to be uh, reserved for idol worship. So they kind of adopted places of worship that were pagan originally. Mm -hmm. And they play that out a little bit in the um, dialogue then that the Samaritan woman has, uh, where they're telling us the only place we can worship is in Jerusalem at the temple, and what we worship up on the mountain. Uh, she mentions and, and mm -hmm. he's like, yep, and that's all spirit mm -hmm. and truth. Yep, spirit and truth. So, so they kind of hated their own people. Yes, like I have. Without a doubt. So yep, it was like I have three. Remember, she says, she says, uh, our ancestor Jacob mm -hmm. dug this well. It was their ancestor Jacob too? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. How they hated each other. So. Absolutely. Because no. families don't always get along. Really? Really. <laughs> All right. A new thing. So as most of us are wary of new things, familiarity is comfortable, predictable, whereas change brings the unknown. And the unknown is scary and strange and uncomfortable and unpredictable. 
But surrendering to Jesus as Lord doesn't leave much room for things to stay the same, since he's committed to changing our hearts and lives and also the whole wide world. In episode eight of The Chosen called I Am He, the disciples are being introduced to the concept of change, radical change, in fact. They went from living in houses to pitching tents, from earning their own way to depending on Jesus to show them the way, spiritually and literally, since they were following him from town to town, from making plans for their lives to having no plan other than serving God for the rest of their lives. So much change would have been debilitatingly scary, except for the fact that it wasn't. So what new thing are you afraid Jesus might lead you to? Missionary work, adoption, ending a toxic relationship, sharing your faith, leaving a job. Anybody? Yes. Yes, all of the above. Yeah. I think anytime you leave, you're called to leave the comfort of where you currently are, there's some level of that inner turmoil that we see. I, I love that they depict Matthew just locking up and leaving, but I don't think there are too many people that hear God's call and don't struggle with it in some way. Yeah, I think we, uh, I relate more to Nicodemus in that sense mm -hmm. than Matthew. Or like the rich young ruler. I followed all these commandments. What more must I do? Sell all you have and follow me. Give it up. You turned and you walked away. Mm -hmm. I do that. I love that stuff. He said, didn't you say that you had a coworker who packed up and moved to Texas or somewhere? Uh, yeah, she was she yeah. my massage therapist. And yeah. You, Bought a, truck. Bought a trailer truck, never yep. drove. Uh, no, I mean, I haven't found out <laughs> if she made the move or not. When people, when people hear that, again, they think that's crazy. Like, do you know what you're doing? Right? Yeah. That's what... Uh, Literally what Gaius asked him. That's what I was trying yeah. to do. Yeah. yeah, and there's a part in me, right, when somebody that we know who is like-minded and shares the faith with us and they do something boldly like that, my first inclination is you're nuts. Mm -hmm. Did you say about that? And, you know then, that told you that? and then I try to check myself and say, well, yeah. Yeah. it appears to be in line with God's character to sometimes call people to do that. Mm -hmm. So who am I to say no, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know the conversations she's had with God right. on it. Um, and so I think even as Christians, we need to be somewhat careful in the way that we interact with others who say, God is telling me this. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's also part of our, for lack of a better term, job to help in that discernment process. Right? So as an example, when I read this, what are you afraid of? Right after Phil moved, my dad drove him down, in the, or, you know, drove the moving truck down and met with Phil. And I guess there was a conversation my dad and Phil had about me <laughs> when they were down there. And the conversation was Phil going, when is Steve going to leave his job and do ministry? Mm -hmm. He never shared that with me when he lived here. But I guess he had nothing to lose. He lives a few hundred miles away now. So, <laughs> so he shared that with my dad. My dad, I guess, told me later, he's had this thought. My dad has had that thought for a very long time. As well. And then Jeff Myers has approached me recently and said the same thing. Right. So one person says it and you're like, okay, cool, thanks. Now that there have been three people and others along the way who have said, 
you should maybe look into this. I think God uses those types of moments, right? And we're, what I mean when I say that helping people to discern those things, right? If we, like Christ would, approach people with kind questions, oh, Billy, God's telling you to do that? Like, what? We're, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, how did you get there? Right? And it's like, oh, I just woke up this morning and was like, I'm going to go buy a truck. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's try to dig in a bit more. But it's like, man, for, for months I've been restless and really praying for discernment. And I've had a few people kind of come to me and, oh, okay, now, this feels a little bit different, right? Not that God wouldn't some morning just randomly call you somewhere, I suppose. But that's what I mean when I'm saying, like, I think it's part of our job as the body of Christ to make sure that those who are meant to be the arm are doing the arm stuff and those who are meant to be the feet are doing the feet stuff. And if the arm is like, I'm going to be a big toe now, as the body, we should go, hold on, big hand, right hand, like, why are you now going to be a big toe? Like, what makes you think we're just going to switch parts of the body and, and move over there? Because the Bible says that we should cut it off. <laughs> right. It would cause us. <laughs> So. But I think to your point, the, the opposite end of that spectrum is that we shouldn't fear what other people have to say about our calling. Mm -hmm. Because either they will agree with us and they will care and help us to discern, or they won't. And if we feel that we are still discerning, then it shouldn't make any difference. Right. Because the closest person to Matthew <laughs> told him he was nuts. Hmm. But the closest pe person to Peter said, finally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the people Matthew wanted affirmation from had disowned him. Right? Mm -hmm. This is their own son. You know, we saw that when he went to his mom's house and had you ever questioned, have you ever seen this stuff? I'm questioning everything I've ever known. Mm -hmm. You need to leave now. He never even got to the point of, I think I might. Yeah. I've seen this Messiah guy. He was already asked to leave. So I think it's one of the toughest things in our walk is knowing the will that God has for our lives and trying to walk in that. That's sometimes the hardest thing. That was a good point about not being men pleasers, but God pleasers. If you know you've heard from God, if you have that peace, I think there's peace that comes. Mm -hmm. Um that that's what you've got to do. I've been reading in the Old Testament where God uh talked to people who worshiped other gods. You know the king where uh they saw the hand that wrote on oh, the wall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um like was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like though and Daniel, they were faith filled people. And I think they went through those things to convince, I think God walked them through those uh, fiery trials because it made the other people believe. I don't know. Comment, <coughs> talk to me. <laughs> I, I completely agree with you. And uh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar said, you're a God. Yeah, yeah. yes. And they would put out those decrees, the great God of, right. the, of Israel. The, like it completely changed. Or I think of Saul, you know, he was kind of being a jerk. And uh, kind of. <laughs> he was a kind of, like the yeah. people who he had one good chapter <laughs> um, <laughs> on the road to Damascus, like Saul could hear it. And the other people quaked with fear and ran away. I don't know if that was part of it. Or the other side. Uh, yeah. but, yeah. um, he was like, Paul. God can reach out and talk to people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he has to tell me stuff several times before I realize it soon because he speaks to it quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, As opposed to striking you blind. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, I'll take the, the quiet one. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think, I think it's a great point, right, about especially uh, Daniel and his friends, right, that where we sit and we go, 
that is amazing faith. Give me faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Give me, give me faith like Daniel. But we don't take into account all of the preparation that they did to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And they did so much work, and they did so much prayer, and they did so much study, and they shunned the Babylonian culture to, quite honestly, the detriment of their own self to get to the point where they were put into this trial. I think we do a disservice to them by saying, look at that amazing faith in the furnace. Because the years, the many years leading up to that prepared them for mm -hmm. it. And so if we're not doing our prayer life and our and everything that's needed, when we get to that moment that we're given, what if we're not ready? So mm -hmm. I just have to be really careful about asking God to put us in those positions if we haven't done the work yeah. that needs to be done to yeah. get there. They were um, persecuted and slandered and uh, people were trying to get them fired from their jobs and tattling on them and tricking them. Mm -hmm. and but that would have never happened had they not, had they conformed to the Babylonian culture Correct. like they were supposed to. And right. we have to remember that like, they were taken from their parents at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they weren't as, they probably weren't as old as the girls when they were forcibly taken and put into this new place, which mm. what had untold th new things that they yeah. could try. I mean, yeah. And that's like when they rebuilt the temple and Ezra and Nehemiah and those guys went there and um, can't think of the guy's name, Sanballat or something. And they kept trying to stop the work, but these people mm -hmm. were convinced that they heard from God. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't matter what the other people did to them because they heard from God. That's all I'm thinking is we need to hear from God. No. I think that's that's a biblical principle, there's no doubt about it. The wilderness experience, even Moses, Moses was raised and taught by his mother. Mm -hmm. And so when it came to choose his country, the way he chose the country. And uh, yeah, there's definitely true. John the Baptist, you know, my daughter said to me a couple of weeks ago, how come he was walking around in camels for you know, mm -hmm. hair? And I said, well, think about it. I mean, they didn't have a Marks and Spencer back then. He right. was in the desert. So whatever was available, he wore it. Right? <laughs> And the point is, they forget about Moses on a, a John the Baptist's wilderness experience. And believe it or not, even Jesus, mm -hmm. it says clearly that Jesus learned obedience to the things which he suffered. So, yeah, and the Bible is clear about that. It says, do not promote a novice before his time. Right. So, this is a principle that we need to really pay attention to because whenever we run across the Oh, you got to come and hear this 13-year-old preacher boy, you know, mm -hmm. this, this fabulous, exciting thing. Uh, I don't I don't ever go to that <laughs> because it's not scriptural. And uh, your ministry, in actual fact, the way I see it anyway, and I've been around, around for a while, is very short. It's your preparation is long, mm -hmm. but your ministry is short. And that's why the, the Bible talks about elders. It says, choose elders who raise their, family, their children well, right? So I don't want to step on any toes, but we shouldn't have elders that like don't have kids, right? That are just married or 18, 19, 20 years old. Or unruly kids. Or unruly kids. Oh, I'm, I'm done. But anyway, that's just no, but yeah, it's, it's a good point. Is in what you said is excellent, and that is this idea that we can run up to the altar, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and we can go be a Daniel. Right? Right. No, it doesn't work that way. 
It takes time. Mm -hmm. And I think Jesus' ministry shows that, right? He prepared 30 years for yeah. his three yes. years, and he took three years teaching the disciples. Yes. And some of them only had months. Right. Right? Exactly. Like, exactly. And all three of those years, they kept struggling, right? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> right? it took a lot of what was ingrained in them, mm -hmm. right, to... Mm -hmm. Change that off. They were in green. We they were in green to go you around to go some to things and some area yeah. and interact with those people. Oh Jesus! Uh, well, I have, I have some place I want to go, and it'll make our trip shorter. <laughs> yeah, but no, those were both. Those are two really good reasons. Wait, where? So here's an additional question, because I think based on time, we'll keep the Old Testament context till next week. Mm -hmm. So the question that asks us, what new thing are you afraid Jesus might lead you to? What thing do you think our church is afraid of? Matawan Community Church. Yeah. Anything that you step out by faith is always a scary thing. That's why you have Jesus had to encourage us all the time, you know. Just you know, don't be afraid. Any step, any actually stepping out by faith, there's a lot always a lot of fear involved. Mm -hmm. And but without that, it's not really a step of faith either. You know what I mean? I mean, if you've got all your bases covered, it's not a step of faith. So anybody that says, Oh, I'm going to India uh, next week, but I'm not worried about it. Don't go, don't go. <laughs> because you should be worried about it. Yeah. And that forces you to, to trust the Lord, right? You know, you can get in discussions with people, will God give you more than you can handle, right? That's yes. A of discussion. Yes. Exactly. Yes. The answer is yes, he will. Because if you did it, you wouldn't need God, right? You, you well, but he'll never give you more than what he can handle. <laughs> That's right. Right. It's, it's through the whole Bible. I mean, the yeah, Israelites, right? I mean, okay, you have a sea in front of you, then you have the yes. Egyptian army behind you. Yes. This is more than you can handle. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're not armed with anything. You will all be slaughtered. Now, do you trust me? Yeah. Raise your hands, <laughs> Moses, and watch the water, and watch this wind from the east come and dry it all up. Mm. And you'll just walk across. You're absolutely right. He's constantly putting us in things where we have no other option than to trust because our own earthly skill, strength, everything else is not sufficient enough to get through. But I guess I asked that question because, Phil, you probably don't know this since you've uh, only been here a couple Sundays and Wednesdays, but we own 12 acres down there. And we paid an architect to come in and interview and come up with some initial drawings. We showed those. This was years and years and years ago, and then nothing happened. So recently we're on the same thing, and yet more money, new architect, new drawings. After the congregational meeting in the fall, in October, the congregation voted to have the board spend up to, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of dollars, but it was significant mm -hmm. to now get a construction manager. That paperwork, I believe, has now been signed. And so we have meetings coming up over the next mm -hmm. few months of mm -hmm. construction management, architect, and church to try to finalize the plans of what will be future Manawan Community Church. And so what new thing are we afraid Jesus might lead us to for me, I'm sitting there going, building supplies are so expensive right now. Can our church really afford this? Is this really the right time? Can we afford not to? Can we afford not to? Like all these, and then I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, so Silver Grass neighborhood went in right next to our property. Now you've got the little township hall place, whatever, and all that land is now been, is being developed. Yeah. And so God, I feel yeah. it's literally like, you have this land, I gave you this neighborhood, yeah. this little league field, and now another neighborhood. Yeah. Are you going to step out of the boat? Or are you not? Yeah. So 
being on that board, so you know I'm a little afraid because I'm going, the building materials are so expensive. And then I'm reminded too <coughs> that there's no perfect time right. for any of this, right? Mm -hmm. If there was a perfect time to get married, I still wouldn't be married. <laughs> if there was a perfect time to have kids, my daughter wouldn't be sitting next to me because I didn't have enough money at that time, right? Um, one half, one half five. <laughs> and we sure have five, right? Um, so there's no perfect time, but when God says do, mm -hmm. we need to do. Yeah. Um, I remember a pastor once saying, you can't went if you don't go. You can't went if you don't go. You can never say we went if mm -hmm. you don't actually have to go. Right. Um, and I think God is really challenging MCC right now and going to challenging us even more. Where is our trust? Who are we trusting? Are we willing to trust him to bring families, bring the financials, bring things together so that he is glorified and we can serve more people in a better capacity? Question then. Do you think it is better than to attempt to be active in the service of God and make a mistake or do nothing? The first. Why? Because I think God's grace is sufficient. And I would rather someday be told, well done, rather than. You did nothing. Because we see in the parable when the three gentlemen are giving, given talents to go mm -hmm. with, right. two of them do. One that is able to read a lot, the other not as much, but the only third one, well, I buried him because mm -hmm. I was really scared. So you'd not a be, good place for him to be. You would rather be Nicodemus who God uses your mistake for his glory in the end because you continue to do even though you didn't do what you were called to do he continued to do something mm -hmm. and ended up being used than the rich young ruler who I guess I'd rather be late to the game than never be at the game mm -hmm. and I know I'm not going to be perfect in any of this no I agree and there are going to be times where we're walking towards and we think we hear God's calling and it's our own and we stumble and God says that's all right I can use that I can use that back on the path over here rather than where's your buddy are you still at the start line you never mm -hmm. started mm -hmm. he's still flat tying his shoes <laughs> <laughs> wondering if this is the race yeah. he wants to be in yeah. I don't doubt that our church wants to be, we're going to use that analogy in that race. Not that we're racing against any church, but we want to do God's work. And boy, does Meadow and Community Church do a lot in the community mm -hmm. with compassion, with our missions within the church. And yet, is there more we can do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's always more, mm -hmm. right? Specifically as a body, I wonder, hmm. right? Like as a, as a whole communal people. Because I think we can point to certain people, certain families, certain missions that we do a good job of supporting, not, not just money, we do an excellent job with giving, but in terms of with our time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we mobilized more often as a complete church body, what we would be able to do. Mm -hmm. Because I think, I think you have this family that does a really good job here, and you have this family that does a really good job here, and, 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 and these people support this mission in an amazing way, but very rarely do we come together to make a difference in our home and we'll move forward, right? If we could put 40, 50, 60 people together, what could we do? And that scares me. Thanks for the question. What well, scares me too, and Christine and I have talked about this a lot because that's been on both of our hearts for many years, 
And there's been a few times where we present some things to missions or we can to or to someone else. And it's been like, well, um, I, I can't wrap my head around that. I can't, um, where are we gonna get manpower to do that? Those kind of things. And then it's overwhelming to me. So I'm still back at the, the the star line and still standing there. Mm -hmm. So I agree. And the flip side, I mean, that pendulum swings all the way to the other side, right? Our church can't do everything. Right. 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 We can't support every mission under the sun. We yeah. can't support every program. We can't expect people to be here from eight in the morning until eight at night, Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday either, right? right. So and that's that's, that's that thing where I think as our church body, we even need to define those mission things that we feel God has called our church body to support because mm -hmm. we have not just the monetary ability to support, but we have manpower. We have the abilities to do that some churches are really really good at doing inner city type of mission work i'm not sure we have all of that here now does that mean we can't or we shouldn't no but is that going to be our main mission field i would guess probably not well, we can't right spread now, ourselves so thin. Exactly. And you have you do have to do some. Yeah. So I know we went through it a few years ago of just going, okay, what what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. Like the soup suppers. Do you remember the soup suppers we used to do way back in the day? And then it just became a burden. Mm -hmm. Nobody could support it anymore. And for what? If like we had no good reason to do it anymore. We couldn't say the money raised goes toward this. It was just an activity that became a habit and people in the community still ask me yeah you know, we, hey, are you ever going to do those soup suppers again right and we yeah, finally we had to say okay and the, grand, help do the work. Yeah, and the grand scheme of things <laughs> that did not fit into what we felt what god was calling us to do and we unfortunately had to let it go but it, that was really freeing for the church <laughs> well <laughs> because it wasn't we, a burden anymore the people that could work it what around I any mean, they were dying off. They were dying. plus and those of us who would like to have kept it going we couldn't take three, three days off of work to do it every month you know start the bread on uh on tuesday so it's ready by friday then. oh anyway yeah yeah i think it's okay um if it has a season uh, yes but i would encourage us to wrestle with what you're scared that god might do mm -hmm. um in your life and lean into that and get a little excited about that that god's not done with you yet um there's still more that he wants to use you for for his purpose that should excite us um what it looks like who knows and it'll, it'll be different for all of us mm -hmm. um, with that said i think we should close out Anybody who wants to pray to close this out or? Sure. Thank you. Father, we thank you that you lead us uh, throughout life, even when uh, you take us places that we didn't expect to go. We thank you that uh, you go before us, behind us, and to each side, protecting us from from things in life that might not have our best interests at heart. We know that um, there are still times where we stumble, and stub our toes, or we wandered off the path. We thank you that you are patient enough to bring us back, put us on uh, the narrow way that leads ultimately to you. We thank you that you have chosen us to be your people, to be your hands and feet in this world, to lead others, along that path towards your son, Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice that he was willing to walk that path alone in a way that none of us could. 
We thank you that you loved us enough to send him to earth, to be one of us, and to die for us. As we go through Lent, help us to remember um, why we do what we do. It is for uh, our respect and admiration of him that we are able to uh, come to you, to pray to you, and stand before you forgiven uh, and clean. Help us to go where you want us to go, not necessarily where we're used to going. That when you tell us to turn right, that we would follow it. To be in the places where you need us to be, to meet the people that you need us to meet, and to serve those uh, who are in desperate need of knowing you, your son, uh, and your spirit. We thank you for the guidance of the spirit every day and the sacrifice that we have through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.